Welcome to another episode of a, a Fresh Perspective with your favorite conservatarian, Jeff Charles. And I have another fire conversation for you today. I have another special guest. He hails from Atlanta, Georgia, where woke corporatism is holding sway. <laughs> he is the head of the Job Creators Network. I give you Alfredo Ortiz. How you doing, brother? Jeff, I am doing great. Thank you so much. If I were any better, I'd be you. <laughs> now that is a great answer. <laughs> uh, so uh, first, before we get into the to the hot topics, can you tell us a little bit uh, more about yourself and about the Job Creators Network, what you guys do? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Well, I have to tell you, I am truly a blessed, blessed person because I am living the American dream. Uh, you know, I'm a son of immigrants. My mother was a housekeeper. Uh, my dad was a tailor. We were uh, I was born in Chula Vista, California. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was, a, it was a, a poor life. It really was growing up. And we used to go around on trash day. And my mom and I would, you know, collect aluminum cans and newspapers and take it over to the YMCA, cash that in. And that was our grocery money for the week. Uh, but she also was the first entrepreneur that I ever, ever knew and ever met. Um, she put on the best darn garage sales you can imagine. Uh, at, I always remember, you know, garage sales would be at starting at 7 a.m. on a Saturday at you know, 6.45, 6.30, there were people in line waiting for that garage to open. She always had the best stuff in there. So um, so that was my first kind of, you know, brush with entrepreneurialism, just growing up with my mom. Uh, but, you know, fast forward to where I am today, uh, you know, first one to finish high school, first one to finish college, first one to finish grad school. Um, you know, so again, you know, I'm just living the American dream. I've worked in, uh, you know, Fortune 500 companies. Uh, most importantly, probably for this conversation, I own my small business. In fact, here in Georgia, uh, two small businesses. I had a consulting company and a construction company. Mm -hmm. um, so I've signed the front of a check, but I also signed the back of a check as an employee of a lot of these companies. Um, and I've been doing, uh, you know, heading up Job Creators Network now. This is my eighth year, believe it or not. Which is oh, wow. The thing. Uh, but it's all about defending small businesses and advocating for small businesses. And Jeff, as you know, it's really hard for small businesses to have a collective voice. It's a lot easier for large companies. You know, they have the U.S. Chamber, the Business Roundtable, all those, you know, they have their own resources. But small business owners, you know, we, we count pennies. We count every single penny. And right. it's very, very difficult to, to go out there to fly to D.C. I remember I had a committee meeting once and they said, we don't understand why small business owners don't show up to these things. We put out the notice. I said, you guys are kidding, right? You put it out with two days notice. You expect <laughs> small business owners to drop everything that they have, fly up here, have some random meeting with you guys. I'm like, why don't you get on a bus and go out to them? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah really. Really feedback. So, so, you know, so Job Creators Network is a fantastic organization. It was actually founded by one of probably our greatest American dream stories, uh, Bernie Marcus. He actually started Home Depot at 54. So for anybody who uh -huh. thinks that it's too late to start something new, yes, again, it's not. Um, and he started, you know, what is now probably one of the most successful uh, corporations in America employing over 425,000 people. Oh, wow. Started with two stores in Atlanta. Um, and uh, so he remembers all too well what it was like to be a small business owner struggling, you know, with taxes and regulations, red tape, um, and, and the challenges that these small business owners have. And that's why he really started Job Creators Network to be able to advocate and give small businesses a voice where there is no voice. Um, and so I couldn't be more blessed and excited to be representing you know, 30 million small business owners out there in this country employing 60 million hardworking people. And Jeff, finally, as you know, 2020 was disastrous for our small businesses. Right. We saw the report that just came out today, for example, in New York, that roughly a third of small businesses in New York went under last year. Horrific, mm -hmm. horrific numbers. Um, but, you know, those numbers, not quite as bad across the country. Um, some of those blue states that like Connecticut, I think also got hit pretty hard. Um, but, you know, across the board, a lot of our small businesses, 2020 was probably one of their worst years. And so we're here to help give that voice and fight back. And, uh, you know, I know we're going to talk about the Major League Baseball pullout, but mm -hmm. that's one of the things we're in the middle right now of fighting because, you know, that really hurt. It really stung our small businesses uh, in Georgia. And uh, we're going to try, try, try to get that back, to be quite honest. Good, good. So, so before we dive into uh, the Major League Baseball, can you give us an idea? Uh, so, is, the Job Creators Network is it is it more of like a lobbying group, or you know, it's um yeah you know you know I know that you know you got the K Street lobbyists and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's easy to buy lobbying support, right? You just need to write a big check. 
Right. Um, for, for Job Creators Network, we're really advocates. I kind of call us kind of missionaries of free enterprise is probably the best way to describe it. Okay. Um, you know, we're out there, you know, we definitely pass the hat around because, you know, we're, we're both a, a, we're a nonprofit, we're a C3 and a C4, which basically means, you know, we've got a foundation, but we also have an advocacy arm, which, you know, I run. Um, but, you know, what we do is we really advocate for small business. We don't care, quite frankly, if they're Democrat, if they're Republican, independent, mm -hmm. black, white, yellow, green. I mean, we fight for small businesses, period. Um, and so, you know, we look, especially also on job creation or even destruction, anything that impacts jobs, good or bad, we will look at and we will get involved in if we think it's something that we need to get involved in. Okay. Okay. So, so is it more like to, to, to build awareness about small businesses? That's right. or, okay. Yeah. Awareness of small businesses. You know, we do have a member network. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly large, which we love. Uh, but we really mostly look at advocating and bringing awareness to the plight of many of our small businesses. Like I said, mm. you know, you're a small business owner yourself, so you understand yeah. this, right? It's 24 seven, right? It's 24 seven. When I own my small business, even when I went to sleep, I was thinking about my small business, right? Yeah. Uh, because you have employees, right? You have vendors that count on you, right? And so this is something that's so critical. Um, and so what we try to do and we tell our small business members is that that's what we're here for. We're, we're here to, to, to not sleep at night so that you can. <laughs> Good. I, I like that. I mean, that that's needed. That is definitely needed. Um, so, right. so is the, so, so is the organization, is, is it growing right now or how, how are things looking for, for what, for what you guys are doing right now? Yeah, it really is, you know, especially with some of the, um, you know, because of, of uh, the COVID uh, issue that happened in 2020, um, there were some real challenges for our small business owners. So, you know, I pretty much, uh, you know, converted the entire organization into uh, helping people with the Paycheck Protection Program, understand how to, you know, sign mm -hmm. up for that. Um, also trying to fight back some of these crazy regulations on the, the school closings, because that had a direct impact on many of our small business owners, because many of them, you know, also had kids and would have right. to stay home and they couldn't run their businesses or they were trying to run their business and teach their kids at the same time. Mm -hmm. I mean, truly disastrous from that perspective as well. And so, yeah, we try, we try to really shine spotlights on many of the issues that challenge our small business owners. Primarily, though, for our small business owners, it's taxes, it's red tape, sure. um, and quite frankly, health insurance. That's another piece that really impacts our small business owners tremendously. And now some of the challenges that the Biden administration is putting forth um, are also things that we're taking on. For example, the $15 minimum wage that's being proposed. The tax hikes, which, you know, if we can spend some time on later, I would love to talk about that. But then more red tape, right? These are the three things that, frankly, over the past four years in the Trump administration were really tackled and were really reduced, especially taxes and the red tape. And now the big concern is a lot of that's coming back, uh, which our big concern from Job Creators Network is that it could lead to uh, what we termed under the Obama administration was negative entrepreneurialism where more businesses were closing than were actually opening. We're very fearful that we're going to go down that path pretty quickly again. Okay. Yeah. We definitely need to delve into that maybe on a, on a different conversation. Cause that sounds like that can be just that one topic. Could oh yeah. The time. Yeah. Yeah, for so, sure. Yeah. So, so let's talk about Atlanta. I mean, what's going on with the voting laws and I know we're, a lot of the focus is on major league baseball, but you've also got airlines getting in on the, uh, what I call the virtue signaling for dollars. Uh, give us your take on that. Yeah. So, you know, it's disappointing. Um, you know, we all know that uh, President Obama famously said elections have consequences, mm -hmm. but you know what also has consequences? Lies. Lies have consequences. Mm -hmm. And really what it comes down to is that the, the, the myths, the lies, the, the half-truths or half-lies, whatever you want to call it, um, led to a lot of corporations, that I think, just jumping on the bandwagon. Um, it, I'd be hard-pressed to say that many of these corporations that signed on the dotted line for boycotts actually read the bill. I actually read everything. I read the synopses. I read the full thing. A lot of the statements, in fact, many of the statements out there are just outright lies, which is very unfortunate. And I think those lies really led to the Major League Baseball pullout, which again, as I indicated earlier, is leading to $100 million of economic damages to our small business owners in the, in the Peach State. And this is a real, real concern where you know, a lot of actions are almost knee-jerk reactions and are not well thought out. And 
you know, frankly, I, I also expect some of these uh, half-truths or lies to be told by politicians and you know, talking heads and political operatives, you know, the Joe Bidens and the Stacey Abrams of the world. But mm -hmm. I just, I expect more of our uh, publicly traded uh, companies and our CEOs, I expect them to do more. I expect them to be held at a much higher standard because the American public trusts them. Sure. And trusted corporations, they also, I think, have a responsibility and need to be held accountable when they basically help string along lies. So, so let me ask you this. I mean, because I'm hearing a lot of, uh, especially on the conservative side, we're saying, oh, they're bowing to the left or they're giving in to pressure from the left. But I personally, I haven't seen much pressure being put on them by the left. And I have my own theory. But what, why do you think these corporations are, are, are engaging in this? Well, they, they actually got a lot of pressure uh, from Stacey Abrams and from other uh, organizations uh, that basically threatened boycotts and uh, said that any organization that supports the Georgia voting law would be considered racist and supporters of Jim Crow 2.0. Mm -hmm. um, look, it's, you know, the fear of boycott is real. This cu cancel culture, uh, it, it's real. And a lot of these organizations fear these boycotts, fear that they're going to have issues in the boardroom, fear that they're going to have, you know, people picking at their, at their front steps. And, and, and frankly, the, on that front, the left does a very good job of this. Uh, Democrats, you got to give them credit. They know how to boycott. They know how to pick it. Uh, conservatives don't really know how to do that. I'm not sure if just their conservative nature or whatnot, but not a great job of actually boycotting. Uh, the best boycott I've seen so far was the boycott when Goya Foods was being uh, boycotted, uh, led by AOC. It actually led to revenue growth during that time frame for Goya Foods because people yeah. were buying the Goya Foods. But that, that, I tell you, is probably the only time I've actually really seen that. So a lot of these corporations just really quickly jumped on that bandwagon um, saying, you know, the restrictive nature and, you know, and many of the things that, uh, that Stacey Abrams had, had, had put forth, they just accepted as truth. And it's really unfortunate that that took place because when you really break it down, a lot of these primary truths like the voter ID, for example, just not true. You know, number of days of voting, just not true. You know, they said that it was being shortened. It actually was extended by a couple of days. Uh, you know, the voter ID requirements, you know, they were saying was so restrictive. It's actually less restrictive here than it is in Georgia, excuse me, in Denver, where the Major League Baseball went to go put the All-Star uh, game. So, you know, it's stuff like that that's really quite disappointing that, that these CEOs really kind of bent to that uh, cancel culture mentality without really, really doing their own homework. So, so let me ask you this, just to, to th just to throw an objection at you, just to see your, 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 your reaction. When it comes to boycotts, I mean, you mentioned Goya Foods, but I know that it doesn't always result in an increase in revenue, but it doesn't really seem like in this day and age that boycotts really work. Is it possible that some of these corporations may have fears that are unfounded? I mean, could this really damage their bottom line if they don't comply? Yeah, you know, I, I think it does. And, and, you know, again, I don't have all the specifics, of all the corporations, right. but, you know, when you look at also, I think it also, they're afraid that it impacts, you know, the employee base, a lot of these that are unionized, for example, when you look at Delta, you know, you've got the, uh, um, the, the um, flight attendants union, um, you know, many of those uh, supported, you know, Stacey Abrams from that perspective. And so I think they're just concerned that they may not only have boycotts, but they may have strikes, they may have sick -ins. Morale issues. Morale issues. And I think from a corporation standpoint, they just don't want to deal with it. Um, and it's just much easier to say, yep, where I sign on the dotted line so that I, I can basically get a pass, uh, you know, on this. Okay. Okay. That, that's a sensible answer. That, that, that does make sense. So, so let me ask you this. If Major League Baseball hadn't made this decision that they made and had the All-Star Game in Atlanta... Give us an idea of how that would have benefited that local economy. Because I've got people telling me, oh, well, the All-Star game would have been held in a suburb outside of Atlanta. And so it wouldn't have really done much. Can, can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah. So, so the, the specific uh, suburb is actually it's called Cop, it's Cop County mm -hmm. is where the stadium is. And uh, a very, very large majority of those businesses that service the stadium are actually minority-owned businesses, as they say, black and brown. Yeah. Uh, businesses. But um, so it would definitely impact. And, and the, the estimate uh, that we've seen from, from Cobb County Commissioner is about $100 million of lost economic revenue um, mm -hmm. from the pullout. And so you can even think about Uber drivers, for example. 
somebody's got to drive people back and forth to, you know, to the airport and to the stadium. And then, you know, from stadium to the restaurants, to the hotels. Um, when you think of all those hotels that have been closed this entire time, basically because of COVID, this was probably one of their first big opportunities to fill those rooms, um, which is a big, big deal. The restaurants, the, the taverns, bars, all that. These were all different uh, opportunities for them to really finally maybe fill their coffers a little bit after the horrific 2020 that they had. And so um, a lot of folks had made plans for that. A lot of people had, you know, uh, looking at hiring to get ready for that. And so this is all something that is just a true economic mishap as far as we're concerned. So, I mean, cause that's what, that's kind of my, what was my answer too. I mean, cause if I'm going to go to an all-star game, even if it's in a suburb, I'm going to stay in Atlanta. That, that's where all the stuff is happening. I'm, that's where I want to go buy stuff where I want to go, that's right. you know, have a few drinks. So, I mean, there's yeah. no way that having that all-star game wouldn't have been a huge boon to that economy. Yeah. And, 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 and to your point, by the way, I mean, if you think the beautiful downtown Atlanta that it is, uh, it's got a wonderful aquarium. It's got, you know, the, the CNN, uh, uh, you know, viewing. It's got Olympic Park, really some wonderful things. You've got, you know, the Martin Luther uh, King, you know, site to, to the people go visit. There's so much richness and history in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, and all those local small business owners and all those other surrounding areas would have benefited as well. So, let me, and, and I don't know if you'll know the answer to this, but uh, when it comes to the small businesses in Atlanta, are any of them pushing back against this? Like, especially minority owned businesses, are they speaking up or are they just kind of, you know, just gonna, are they taking it on the chin or do they agree with it? Or what's your sense of, from what you've seen in Atlanta? Yeah, you know, it's a little bit kind of what I said at the beginning of, of our conversation here is, is that it's hard for them to do that, right? It's just, it's just disappointment. It's heartbreak. It's, it's kind of disbelief, but look, the one thing, and you know this as a small business owner, you have your ups and downs. Right. Right. Not everything's going to work out. And the one thing you got to love about entrepreneurs, they just figure it out, right? They may shrug their shoulders and they look down and they go, wow, I can't believe that happened. But they can't focus on that for much longer than that. They got to keep going forward. They got to move forward. They got to figure out. And in some cases, sadly, like in New York, they also then have to go, wow, that was my last chance to stay open. Without that, I'm just closing up shop. Um, and that's what happened pretty much in New York. It just went way too long. The, the, the shutdowns happened for way too long. And a third of the restaurants, a third of the businesses, small businesses closed down in New York. And so I'm a little afraid that we might be at that point where uh, that's a serious concern that some of these small businesses may have been looking at that as kind of their last opportunity uh, to be able to stay open. And then with the pullout that they may be reassessing their futures at this point. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that, that's definitely, definitely something to, to keep an eye on. I mean, I know Georgia's yeah. more open than other states, but that doesn't mean that the lockdowns and the orders that did happen aren't going to have their impact. Yeah, because uh, remember, it's not just really kind of the, the government issue, but it's also the fear that was put in the minds of consumers uh, that you couldn't leave your house, right? You had to stay in your right. basement. Um, and, and, and no matter what the government said, if you had a governor like a DeSantis, I mean, Consumers are consumers and they have to be convinced that it's safe for them to leave. And so, um, you know, now they're going out and folks are traveling. And that's why this was, I think, so devastating, because I really do believe there's a lot of heartbreak out there right now. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, that there is. Um, and uh, so I want to pivot over to, to an issue that you guys uh, discuss quite a bit, and that is the $15 minimum wage. I mean, that was, you know, up for a vote uh, just last month, I believe. Right. Uh, give us your, your, your take on that. Yeah, so really concerning for our small businesses, the idea of a one size fits all just is not true. Uh, you know, what works for, uh, uh, you know, California uh, doesn't work for West Virginia. And, um, you know, the, the idea that it, it will just shows, frankly, how, how out of touch a lot of these politicians are, because that's just not the case. Um, and the impact alone that that would have on jobs the Congressional Budget Office uh, estimated that it would have up to 2.7 million jobs lost, um, but that it would pull up 900,000 people out of poverty. Well, the other thing that pulls out of people out of poverty is economic prosperity. And we saw that between 2017 and 2019. And again, the Congressional Budget Office said that the $15 minimum wage would pull out 900,000 people uh, out of poverty, but 6.5 million people were pulled out of poverty to between 2017 and 2019, the same number of years estimated for the 900,000. So more than seven times the number of people 
that a federally mandated $15 minimum wage would have was achieved through economic prosperity. So we know what works. So why break it? So, okay. So uh, let, let me make sure I'm understanding this right. So it sounds like um, the main issue that you're having is the idea of, of a federally mandated minimum wage, but not necessarily allowing states to decide what the min minimum wage should be. W would that be fair to say? Or am yeah, I very, very fair to say, I think this should be a state to state issue. Um, and, and quite frankly, supply and demand should also, you know, just let, let the economics of it work itself out. Because in some cases, for example, you have Bank of America that I under, my understanding was at the beginning of last year, their minimum wage for tellers, for example, their beginning wages was $20 an hour. And so again, because the economic prosperity was great and everybody was working, they wanted to basically, they felt uh, you know, the economy was fantastic. And so I think allowing uh, people to operate in that fashion, and if you're gonna mandate anything, at least let that be done at a state by state level let the citizens of that state vote on it if they need to, like happened in Florida, like happened in Colorado. Um, but, you know, even in Florida, for example, because I know the Democrats point to Florida as one example of where, look, it passed and nobody has a problem. Well, one of the biggest problems or one of the biggest reasons that it passed and it, there, there, weren't, there wasn't as much pushback is because they kept something that was called the tip credit, which is very relevant for waiters because it basically allows, uh, you know, wait staff and stuff like that to basically get tips um, that are far above and beyond what the minimum wage would be. And so it brings down the minimum wage to something like $2 or $2.50 an hour, because they'll never see that. They may see 15, 18, 20, $25 an hour because of tips. And so that was allowed in the uh, Florida law, for example, whereas in what was trying to be passed at a federally mandated level would disallow the tip credit, which would basically mean that you would no longer be able to be set up that way and small business owners in particular in the hospitality industry, they don't have those resources to be able to pay the equivalent of 18 to $20 an hour. So they would just start not hiring people. Um, and, and so that's just gonna really hurt a lot of folks who really are the ones that are dependent on, the, on those tips. Yeah, see, it does seem like it would definitely harm the hospitality industry quite it, a bit. A lot. Yeah. So what is your sense from, I mean, because obviously you, you have your finger on the pulse of this. Obviously, most of most Republicans in Congress are against this. Uh, what is your sense from Democrats? I mean, are there Democrats who, were, who, were, who you see as people who would push back on something like this? Yeah, well, Joe Manchin actually is the one that was probably the, the loudest voice from the Democrats. Always Manchin. I'm sorry? <laughs> It's always Manchin. <laughs> it is. It is Manchin. You know, I have to say, I, I, I give give the guy a lot of credit. He he he's standing up for his beliefs and values, and even though he's being uh, beaten up on, it doesn't look like he's he's budging uh, from that. Um, but but he was, I think, offering about an eleven dollar uh, minimum wage. Look, overall, we just don't think this should be a federally mandated uh, right. issue. We think this should be done at the state levels, the one size fits all. And even within that, if you think about industry by industry. Uh, Amazon, for example, said, hey, great, we're paying more than $15. They were out lobbying for that. Well, that's really easy if you're Amazon and your profit right. is whatever, hundreds of millions of dollars. And you can you have three different huge portfolios. One is the Amazon Web Services. Mm -hmm. Then you have Amazon and you have Whole Foods. And you can kind of go back and forth between profit pools. If you're a small business owner. You don't have that ability to do that. And so even... Uh, you know, some folks out there, uh, large corporations, for example, Costco, they said, look, we're paying our folks $15 an hour, but we're not in any way saying that others should be doing the same thing. That needs to be left up to their own business model. Yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, and, and it's always the small business owners who are going to suffer from a lot of these uh from a lot of these moves that the left makes, I mean, with Atlanta, that's not going to damage the large businesses that are no. based there. It's going to dam damage the mom and pop. I mean, right. the person, like, like myself, who's just, you know, trying to do his own thing, being a solo. Yeah, that's right. Well, and just to give you a live example, when, when I had my own little consulting company, I wanted to hire people who really, you know, had pretty high salary requirements. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do that right off the bat. So what did I do? I offered a piece of my company to them. So you know, allow for that kind of flexibility, especially for our small business owners, because they want to bring in town, they want to grow their businesses. And so, you know, allow them to do that. Because one thing people seem to forget, every large business started as a small business. Yep. Yeah. 
yeah, and they should have that flexibility, or dare I say, they should have that freedom and liberty right. to be able to, to, you know, run their business as they yeah. see fit. And they, may, they might offer other benefits, you know, work from home right. or flex hours, you know, things that large cor- corporations can't possibly do. They may be able to offer a higher salary or higher wage per hour, but maybe some of those flexible benefits they can't. Small business owners compete that way. Yeah. And one thing I want to talk about before, before, before we stop, and I, I didn't tell you about this before, but I'm sure you're, you've got your finger on the pulse of this too, but, but the PRO Act, uh, what, what kind of, you know, what, what kind of advocacy are you doing on that front? Or, or, or is that an area that you would deal with? Yeah. So, so we, we've made a couple of comments on the PRO Act and we're concerned about that too, because that basically, you know, uh, hits on the, the right to work states, for example, and stuff like that. And, and there's multiple other things under the, under the PRO Act that they're trying to do, but you know, we think if you look at uh, right to work states, they're doing fairly well. Uh, when you look at a lot of these companies where, you know, they leave it up to the employees to vote unions in or out. I haven't seen many employees vote the unions in. So, you know, I think that says something. Um, I, I, I'm sure unions, you know, frankly predated me uh, from that perspective in terms of their, their, their necessity at some point in history. Uh, but in this environment where you have a 24-7, you know, social media environment where if you sneeze incorrectly, it's going to go on social media. Mm-hmm. You can't afford as an employer not to treat your employees uh, in, a, in a way that's going to be a positive experience for them. Because as soon as you do, it's going to go on social media. Yep. Um, and so that in itself is almost the great equalizer. And so from my perspective, I think unions are finding difficult to get their memberships. Up because of that, I think people are just finding there's less and less of a need for them. And some of the benefits, for example, that are being negotiated, the supply and demand of, of labor basically is taking care of a lot of that. And especially as we see in some of these states, these red states where you have unemployment rates that are now you know, back to the four to 5% range, they're having, employers are having a really tough time finding employees. So they're thinking of all these different ways of offering benefits and stuff like that. So the need for unionization, I think, goes away. Uh, but, but a lot of the issues that the PRO Act uh, tackles, uh, we're concerned because it really goes against the face of free enterprise and the freedoms and liberties that I think businesses should be able to enjoy and frankly negotiate with their employees. Because the one thing employees can do is they can go next door possibly and find another job there that pays better, has right, more right. benefits. And so, again, I think social media has turned out to be the great equalizer and now is probably serving a lot of the role that unions did decades ago. Great. Well, yeah, you definitely have accomplished something in pointing out something positive about social media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a little harder now, but that is one thing that I think it definitely does. It, it does equalize a lot of things. And, you know, there's this idea of, of perfect information. Well, social media really allows you to have more information at your fingertips and, and honestly the internet does as well. And so people can do their own research very quickly. And, and, and so, you know, again, I think, I think the PRO Act is, is concerning. Uh, we're, we're not as involved in that. We will be commenting on that, but again, it's more of a, what I would call kind of a larger company issue, but it does disproportionately impact small businesses. And I will tell you one thing on this is mm-hmm. that as more regulations are set and, and more barriers are set, it makes it harder and harder for the small business owners to actually keep up with those regulations. I remember several years ago under the Biden administration, I was on tour visiting small business owners and I had one guy point to a pile that he had of unopened mail. He said, see that huge pile there? He goes, all that's from federal agencies. Mm. I have no idea what it says. I don't open it anymore because so much is coming. I figure I'm just gonna keep operating my business until I get fined. Wow. You know, he goes, because they're changing so quickly and so rapidly. I can't afford to keep a full-time lawyer on staff just to keep up with, with regulations coming. And so, you know, the, the impact on small businesses is real and severe. Okay, great, great. Well, uh, thank you for taking the time to speak with me. Why don't you tell the audience where they can find you? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity for that. Jobcreatorsnetwork.com. I think you can kind of see the words behind me. Yep. Uh, Jobcreatorsnetwork.com. We'd love folks to come visit the site, uh, totally free to do so. Uh, we've got free membership, we've got paid memberships, uh, but we really try to provide with as much information as possible for our small business owners that we believe is important and relevant to, to their daily lives. 
Okay, great. Well, thank you for joining me. And uh, we, we got to have you back on. We, we've got more to talk about here. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Thank you.